Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, President Calulade, welcome to Nashville, Tennessee. It's an honor to host you at Vanderbilt University, and I just want to mention that I'm very much looking forward to having a conversation with you about some of the pressing issues that we face in this world today. Uh, before I start, I want to make a note for the audience that um, President Calulade has made it very clear that she's willing to take live questions from the audience. Um, I think that that's a wonderful opportunity for us to engage with somebody in an unscripted environment. A head of state, this is a rare opportunity for us to have a wide and free-ranging conversation with President Calulade. So for those of you who are interested in submitting questions, uh, you can submit them. There should be a, a link up here. <laughs> Where can they submit them? Um, hopefully we'll put the link up here and then those questions will be relayed to me and I'll do my best to weave them into the conversation that we have with each other. Uh, to begin, I want to start with a conversation about the major issue at hand today. Uh, a lot of us are very concerned about the war in Ukraine. And so let's just dive right in. Um, you are in a unique position of authority, I think, on this subject. Uh, Estonia, as we all know, borders Russia. Um, Estonia and Russia have a back and forth relationship, um, sometimes with tensions. Uh, and in addition to that, there's a Russian-speaking minority population in the border regions. Could you help us understand from your perspective and your vantage point, what happened? How did this war begin? Yes, uh, the war began in 2008 in Georgia. Uh, then uh, Georgia was a country which decided that he wants to align itself more with the free world, European Union, NATO ambition. And uh, Russians decided uh, that they don't want to have it. Prior to Georgian war, they tried to uh, negotiate. In 2007, it was then President Medvedev, Putin was prime minister, and they shift sometimes, you know. And, uh, and they tried to negotiate the world order, saying it needs to be more, like we need security guarantees, zones around us, safety around us, no NATO to close. And we said no. And then they acted, and we didn't react in 2008. And the avalanche started 2014, Crimea was occupied, and here we now sit with this new war. You could still ask why such a big war, why such a try to run over the whole country? I mean, it's a huge country, only three and a half times smaller by population than Russia itself. And this is a kind of a very interesting element where Putin went wrong. We saw that he never thought that people have a will. He's always treated people as objects, not subjects. Remember when Belarusians rose out, up against Lukashenko? Then he told, this is just West enlarging its sphere of influence. Being an Estonian, I know how hard it is to get into the Western sphere of influence. All the applications to the European Union, NATO, everybody's like, no, no, we cannot have them. I mean, it will anger Russians and all this. Nobody in West enlarge spheres of influence, but this is how he thinks. People are object and the powers are acting over them. So he didn't believe that Ukrainian people really care whether they go out on the street and, to, and live their daily life under President Zelensky or President Putin. And that's why he started this war. Our weakness and the miscalculation. So do you, you think his miscalculation was that he fundamentally underestimated the Ukrainian people? And he wasn't alone. I heard a few days before the war broke out, uh, people discussing in Europe that uh, Ukrainians will not fight. Maybe for a few weeks, yes, but not really. And luckily, when we were demonstrating the courage of Ukrainian people. We at least started to support them, which is a big thing to do. So do you think this is unique overconfidence that Putin has? Because I think on the eve of the war, most people in the world thought that this, would, this is a war that would, that would take maybe just a matter of a couple days, that the Zelensky regime would be toppled. Um, I think most experts in the world sort of assumed that the same thing would happen. Yeah, uh, and we were arguing because we have seen Ukrainians build up their army. I've been to Ukrainian military parade. I mean, it was a menacing force who has eight years mentally, not only physically, prepared itself to this war which is now going on. Mm. And the result is what we see. They are able to hold their own positions. And if we keep supplying Ukrainians, 
they have a real chance of really winning this war and not winning it only for themselves, but for all of us, because they are standing out for free world in general. So how would you assess, how would you grade the efforts of the West and NATO partners in supporting Ukraine, the tactics? Is there more that should be done? Well, it's always been the case that, I mean, we are reacting relatively late. We are always late to the world wars, as some people now like to say in Estonia. The West is always late. It's partially, it's unavoidable because we are democracies and the leaders cannot move faster than the public support allows them to do. You, you cannot break the link to your own people. So it's unavoidable that we are late. But first things, if we had used the sanctions regime, which we are now using in 2008, do you think this war would even ever have happened? No. Now, when the war broke out, it probably cost the lives of already thousands of Ukrainians while we were making our minds up. I mean, it's very uncomfortable feeling that making up your mind costs somebody's lives. But let's face it, if we had from the day one been ready to support with the weaponry Ukrainians are now having access to, probably less of the loss of the life would have happened. Loss of a territory anyway has not happened. Russia is more or less, I mean, standing where it was. I mean, the gains are really, um, really minor uh, compared to the human uh, life loss on both sides. But I mean, we are gearing up. And this is what really matters. And as Zelensky says it very honestly, our lives, your weapons, we can beat this threat to the free world order. And this is how it is. But there is one little bemol. Ukrainians are, in principle, fighting for their own freedom not for the freedom of us. So when they feel that they are ready to, well, go and negotiate, this might not be yet the death of the regime of Putin. Mm. And then the ball comes back to our court. We have to keep the economic sanctions exactly as we are, if necessary, even stronger. Because otherwise, the threat would not have gone away. We cannot count on Ukrainians to be able to fight to the total end of the regime, which we currently see in Russia. And it's not only Putin, it's a regime. We have to keep this in mind. Stalin left, but I mean, Gulag remained, so it didn't change that much. And it's the same now this time. We have to be ready to accept our own responsibility, which is economic pain to this regime. And I'm really, really worried, because this would be a natural thing for us to do. Yeah. As soon as there is nobody dying anymore to say, well, let's gradually start removing the sanctions. We cannot. This is our responsibility. Otherwise, Ukrainians, yes, they have died for their own country, but they've also died for the free world, and this loss would have been in vain. This is our responsibility. We cannot shy away from. So before we talk a little bit more about the post-war effort and things that the international community should continue to do, um, actually, first, I have a note. For those of you who want to send in emails, send them to modernconflict at vanderbilt.edu. One word, modernconflict at vanderbilt.edu. I'd like to ask you a couple more questions about Putin's frame of mind, his thinking, uh, and ask you to assess his strategy. So do you think that it, he just underestimated the Ukrainian people? Did he underestimate the response of NATO? Do you think that he underestimated the response of the European countries and the Western world in in the retaliatory sanctions. Uh, what else do you think on this front? Well, I, sometimes I see this dream, you know, 2013, and there sits Lavrov and Shoigu and Putin, and, and they are discussing what to do with Ukraine, because, you know, people are demonstrating to join the European Union. This time, not NATO, European Union. And by the way, Putin is not afraid of NATO. He's afraid of democracy and freedom, which means okay. European Union. If he were afraid of NATO, he would not have removed all his troops from NATO's borders. But frankly speaking, there is nothing behind our borders today. Everything is down south. So he's not afraid of NATO. So they sit there, and then Shoigu proposes, but I mean, we occupied part of the Georgia. And they dropped Georgia like hot potato. Nobody's anymore talking about European Union for Georgia, for example. Let's do the same. And then Lavrov says, probably, oh, it will be a huge problem. I mean, I will have to stand up on all these podiums and, I mean, sanctions. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's, uh, I will be so sick of myself of trying to explain all this. And then Shoigu says, I'm kidding. Look, in 2008, it took them three months to get over. Back to the business as usual. 2011, we were discussing visa liberalization with Russia in the European Union. We ourselves taught Putin what should be his strategy. 
let's face it, let's face up to it. Now, finally, this will help us to understand also what is good as a next step. So what do you think that Putin wants? If he's not afraid of NATO, should Moldova be worried? Should Estonia be worried? Do we think that there might be more conflict in Armenia or Azerbaijan? As of 26th of February, at least, he was afraid of NATO. How do we know? They, well, they uh, made an error in publishing the articles they had written to uh, celebrate the winning of the war 48 hours after it broke out. And in one of those articles, there was a sentence which said, if we had not brought Ukraine back to Russian mir now, Russian world now, we should have already gone for them into the Transatlantic, Transatlantic Union which would have not been possible. So NATO, he is afraid of. And we can demonstrate to you very easily that NATO is probably the only hope for the free world to stand up against Russians by what the European people think. There are a couple of um, NATO's partner countries who have never joined because they considered it safer to be neutral, Finland and Sweden they will probably join, looks like. Yeah. No, because NATO has a 100% track record of defending territorial integrity of its members, so he's afraid of NATO. He's also afraid of European Union and democracy, as I already said, so we should keep our push to bring Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, those Eastern Partnership countries who are interested to start accession discussions with the European Union. It's difficult. But the European Union acts best in the crisis. It's able to put all the rule books aside and act. Did so in financial crisis, can do, is already doing. Supports Ukraine, mili uh, Ukraine military buildup with European money. We don't even are allowed by the treaty to support each other in military spending. Yet we're spe spending now there. So we can start accession negotiations with Eastern partnership countries, despite the fact that none of them can today fulfill Copenhagen criteria. No, in normal times, you don't, but this time, so sure. So we should do exactly all this, which what Putin is afraid, to demonstrate how bad it's back. So you, you mentioned the public opinion swing in, in Finland and Sweden with respect to support for NATO membership. Uh, tell us about the reaction to public opinion in Estonia. Is there, is there confidence in Estonia that NATO would have their back if it's the case that something happens there? What's the reaction been? What are the implications of this conflict for Estonians? Uh, yes, we are confident, and you know why? In 2014, uh, NATO started to really take seriously the defending planning and programming for Eastern European countries, and EFP was set up. So NATO troops of 19 NATO nations arrived in Baltic States and Poland. And this was not only tripwire, it was also a test lab. NATO today knows far better than it would have known in 2014 how to defend the eastern flank. It's prepared, it's trained, it's exercised, and it's built up command structures to be able to do so. So deterrence levels have risen, and also, I mean, it's, uh, it's far more clear for everybody in the region how NATO exactly will do this work. If it's an Article 5 situation in 2012, for example, I mean, I don't know how many Russian, uh, how many French tanks would have been sunken in Estonian bogs before they have realized that you do not drive a tank into the bog because it doesn't come out ever. I mean, nowadays we don't have, and this, this is something which I can disclose. There are a lot of, lot of elements we've discovered which uh, cannot be disclosed, but this is very obvious. NATO can defend. And so we trust NATO. Nobody in Estonia is, is, is worried today. Uh, about our security, what we are worried is that many Western financial institutions are taking the whole Baltic and also Nordic region as something you don't invest into. And, and this is, of course, I mean, in long term a problem. But what Estonian people really are daily dealing with is we expect Estonian population to rise by about 10% during this conflict. To compare, 2015, when Merkel, Angela Merkel said, Wir schaffen das, it was about 1 million in Germany it would have had to be 8 million to be comparable what we are expecting in this crisis. We are helping these people daily and hoping that the rest of the world does also what it can. We also have helped the Ukrainian army. We were one of the first to start providing. Javelins went for them first days of the war. And people's mindset is influenced by these things, like somebody goes to an Estonian police office to get the refugee papers. And then they asked, please tell me, what is your home address? 
and people not able to say it, they burst out crying. And you end up with the whole kind of police and border guard office crying, who is these people? Because if you asked, what is your address? And you would have to say Kiev, Mariupol, whatever street, you just cry. That's what is our mindset. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the things that we have learned in, in this war is that the US is very reluctant to be willing to engage nuclear Russia. Um, in my conversations with people in China, um, a lot of people there say that the biggest lesson that China has learned from this is that the United States doesn't dare engage with another nuclear country. So what does this mean for the credibility of NATO if Russia engages a NATO country like Estonia? Is there a real concern that the United States I mean, and there's a history and a track record where nuclear powers tend to avoid each other. Do you think it's really credible that um, nuclear NATO would engage with Russia? I think it is, and I think we've heard, I mean, whoever has been uh, president of the United States, I mean, coming to our region as soon as something goes wrong and says, this is the line, we will defend NATO territory. And we, we all trust it in Estonia. And I have noticed that there are people who say, well, this cannot happen. I mean, what will be left of NATO if there will be even a tiny piece of land in somewhere in the Baltics occupied? Let's imagine it's just wood. I mean, we are not a densely populated country. Nobody might even be dead. But while NATO then sits in Brussels and discusses, will they really fight over a kind of a small plot of wood in somewhere in Latvia or Estonia, NATO dies inside. Cannot afford to do it, cannot afford to do it, and wouldn't do it, I'm quite sure. And of course, there is always this what if tactical nukes were used in Ukraine. Well, we'll come together, assess the situation then, and we'll do something, and I'm quite sure that we will do the right thing there and then, I'm quite sure. But uh, nobody so far seems to be considering Russian threat of using nukes really too seriously. Uh, a question from the audience on this topic. There have been reports of a potential Russian offensive against Moldova and speculation about how Romania may react to such a threat. What possible actions do you think Romania may realistically consider if Russian attack on Moldova seems inevitable? And maybe you can comment a little bit more generally about the risks of spread of conflict beyond Ukrainian borders. Um, Romania is not alone in this. We're all together, and the European Union also, like it did for Ukraine, is, is now getting ready to, uh, to provide resources to help Moldova, if necessary, to, uh, to arm and, and defend itself. It is quite probable, unfortunately, that Russia tries to enlarge the conflict in, in Transnistria and to kind of, uh, well, make our attention to be, to be spread. And then we have no other option than to help and support Moldovans as well. And then some people have been thinking that maybe then Ukraine could go and, and take Transnistria because they're fighting anyway. I don't think this is plausible. We cannot ask Ukrainians to do everything. And in addition, they would be legally on a shaky ground if they, if they exited uh, their own territory. They wouldn't do it. So we have to be ready to prop up Moldova as well. But again, as I say, bringing them as quickly as possible close to the European Union is what we can best do to demonstrate that every such an attempt backfires, Quick. that it doesn't anymore make us to forget these nations as it did in 2008, that this paradigm has quickly shifted. And then it makes kind of meaningless to, to expand uh, into that area. Militarily, wouldn't give anything to, uh, to Russia right now against Ukraine. So uh, Sweden and Finland, as you mentioned, they Public opinion has shifted dramatically in support of NATO membership. They look poised to submit bids in the coming weeks. Um, should NATO also consider membership for Moldova and Ukraine at this point? I think right now we should concentrate in arming them uh, as, as much as, as is possible. Uh, because we've seen that uh, our worry of being considered part of conflict as NATO uh, is quite overwhelming. And therefore, I would forget in these cases formalities and just, I mean, act as if they were members, uh, but not, not discuss uh, the membership situation right now. It's simply more practical, housewifely approach, if you wish, not to go into this kind of 
tricky legal position, which many are afraid of. But we are giving Ukrainians all the weapons we can give them, which they could use, and, and so on, so on. So we're doing what we can. I don't see uh, NATO side going further. And it's an unfair paradigm which history is throwing at us, because we all realize that in long term, I mean, if we could, let's say, take this bifurcation point, go right and left, that, I mean, half of the world goes this way, that, I mean, we engage more, let's say, create this no-fly zone in Ukraine, engage in this conflict, and then look 25 years down the road, might be actually a safer situation. But the other side is that by doing so, NATO would be doing something which it cannot by definition do, which is to rise incredibly high the short-term risk of territorial integrity of some of its member states, maybe all. And it's a paradox of the history, but it is there. So let's be honest about it, but let's keep supporting Ukraine, Moldova, if necessary, with everything we can. How do you see this conflict resolving? What's, what does the end game look like in your mind? How does it end? Well, definitely it will not end because this is not a fairy tale. So that Ukraine will beat Russia and there will be a regime change and we will be back to 1991 and we can start from Yeltsin time again. If it were this, uh, this easy for West, it would be almost unfair, I have to say. When uh, Zelensky and his people decide that they are ready to discuss a peace agreement, it's for them to decide, only for them, for us to supply for them to decide when they stop fighting. But this probably would not have resulted in a regime change in Russia. So now our responsibility, keep up the economic pressure on Russia, because, I mean, it will not change. If there will be an uncomfortable peace agreement, then we'll just, in few years' time, be again where we are today. And I'm, but if I'm afraid of anything, this is that our reaction, if nobody's dying anymore, could be extremely weak. We could, I mean, I already today, I've, I've had discussions. You talk to people and journalists ask already, when would we remove the sanctions then? I'm always like, why are we even discussing it now? And there's no urgency at all in this situation. No, we shouldn't even discuss. If West wants to demonstrate it's not weak, it learns from all the past mistakes since 2008 and, and stays strong. So I trust Ukrainians to do their part. We have still to work to make sure. Luckily, your president here has said that the sanctions have to have a long-term persistent effect on Putin's regime. This is showing some, I mean, right direction. So I think, realistically speaking, if, if the war were to end today, it looks like Russia will have gained um, territories in the eastern provinces. It will have gained territory along the Baltic Sea, maybe. I mean, it depends on how this pans out. Uh, is this a win for Putin? Can he take this home? And isn't this sort of still a positive gain for him, all first things considered? And, first and foremost, I don't see Ukrainians ready to end this war right now. I think they, they have stated quite clearly that at least 23rd of February positions. But I mean, if they get things going, and, and, and we've seen the signs of that, might be Donetsk, Luhansk could be also freed, Crimea probably not. But I mean, I think they are, they are interested still to, to push further. But this is not, I mean, which we should only concentrate on. What Putin would have gained is a twice as long border with NATO as he had before. A realistic uh, perspective of everybody, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, joining the European Union, which otherwise would have been a question of next, I don't know, 50 years maybe. I mean, yeah, if, if you consider this a win, yes. We previously also thought that, I mean, Putin has done a lot to develop also, let's say, NATO's positions in Eastern Europe. So uh, unfortunately, I mean, it, it was still easy to say that he's consolidating us. We are getting some positive gains. But looking at the pictures of what is happening now on, in Ukraine, you don't want with such a price to, I mean, consolidate us. We should be able to do it without such horrible things going on. So however it ends, um, you've mentioned that the international community, at least the Western countries and European countries, need to keep up the economic pressure. Don't relax the sanctions. Uh, but we saw in the aftermath of 2014, in the conflict with Crimea, the world went back to normal relatively quickly. Is it sustainable? Is it really possible yeah. to sustain this type of economic pressure on Russia? I'm with President Biden on that. We have to. If we want to really 
protect the free world, the rule of law based international world order, we absolutely have to. There is absolutely no question about it that we can afford not to. So I'm pleading with all leaders of uh, free Western world, let's stick together in this and let's understand really what is at stake. It is not only Ukraine. Ukraine is a big enough thing, uh, country to have at stake. But this is not about Ukraine. If we are weak, we will only encourage the predator and we cannot afford that. We cannot afford that, not for the sake of Ukraine, not for the sake of the Baltic states or, or Nordic countries, not for the sake of the free world in general, rules-based world order. Because I think there are others who are following, who will you now have an upper hand after this conflict. Will West again have demonstrated its weakness? Do we ourselves have to start accepting that democratic processes are not giving leaders of free and democratic nations the necessary mandates to act decisively. This is our chance to prove this is not so. Our people are supporting us. German people are supporting their government to do more. Let's use this people power. Our people are telling us, be strong, let's be strong. Do you think that that resolve will remain? That's, I think that's an important question because with China backstopping um, Russia and with dependence on Russian energy and and I mean, this is costly for the European countries. There's no doubt about that. So once conflict abates and the atrocities stop, do you think that the European countries have the resolve to, to, to stick it to well, Russia? The still? cynical way of talking about it would be to say that if the conflict lasts longer than the investments done to uh, turn uh, your economies away from Russian energy will, will be big enough to be considered important sunken costs to go back again. But I don't want us to be so unprincipled. I think we need to be principled on this. And uh, we are working daily. I'm not asking myself whether we can manage it, but all, all those uh, political leaders in my region, I mean, who, uh, who, who are talking about these things relatively openly and strongly, I have to say, I'm, I'm really proud of uh, our people in our corner. And your President Biden as well has made it very clear. It is important, it is the most important thing. Well, we have to. So let's pivot away from Yeah, uh, let's the talk about hybrid Ukraine risks or cyber at least. Because I have <laughs> lots of questions here from this audience about <laughs> topics related to cyber. A major theme of this conference has been cybersecurity. And of course we know that Russia launched one of its earliest and most devastating attacks against Estonia in 2007. Uh, we know that Estonia it, is a leading tech hub in the world and that Estonia also, um, most of the government services are available online. Clearly we have a lot to learn from Estonia. In addition, just last week, Estonia hosted these um, NATO-led cyber warfare games. Um, what, is, what are the lessons from Estonia's experience that you can share with us? The starting point, indeed, is 2007, when uh, Estonian e-governance system was attacked by Russians, uh, and it was um, during a time when our relations were tense otherwise. So uh, cyber conflict, as always, is, uh, is something which uh, is complementing what is going on anyway in the analog life. But I would like to refer to a far more interesting case study uh, of the last weeks. Indeed, during this NATO exercise, on the wall of the uh, NATO's uh, Center of Excellence on Cyber Defense in Tallinn, somebody scribbled with really childish letters, Kilnet hacked you. And um, at the same time, indeed, uh, our services, government services as well, came under not too strong, but still attacks. So uh, if, I mean, if we think that everything is concentrated only on Ukraine and also see relatively few kind of cyber elements in Ukrainian war, because after all, who needs to bring down systems cyber-wise if you are bombing them? I mean, it's not necessary in that case. In addition, you cannot completely, Russians cannot completely try to shut off communications in Ukraine because they depend on them as well to a certain extent, so they cannot do it. But we can see during this war and irritating kind of things going on also in our neighborhood and I'm sure also it would be the global picture in the free world. For example, we see a lot of kind of tries, I mean, to test, not to attack, but we see tries to test how to attack if, if needed. So this is all going on and we must be ready and I believe this now will definitely apply for the period if, if NATO were to enlarge then I would expect big cyber perturbances in the region uh, 
because, because of that. So we see how this kind of cyber risks complement what is going on in analog world. They do not exist independently. They have been used independently in a hybrid format to try to break our democracies. Not always, it's not worth breaking Estonian democracies. Try US or, or French or, or, or something like that. But they do, they do, they do act, and they're there also in this complicated world. And what is what is tricky in this is that I mean, if electricity was invented, then nobody had to worry about petrol lamps anymore. But now it's all piling up. All the risks are piling up. None, none of the conventional risks have gone away. So cyber cyber is an important part of this war as well, and it's fought on a kind of a wider range of fronts than than the actual war is right now. Thanks for sharing with that with us. I didn't, I didn't know that, that these types of cyber attacks were ongoing during the war. I mean, one of the things that has struck me about the war in Ukraine is how underwhelming Russia's cyber offensive has been. I think a lot of, I, there's certainly some attacks and reports of attacks, but I think that most experts assumed that the scale and intensity of those attacks specifically targeting Ukraine would be significantly larger. Um, what do you think accounts for this? Is this do you think Russia is worried about even more retaliation from the West? Is this another example of Russian incompetence? No, I, I simply think that, I mean, if you are ruining the cities conventionally, you don't bother wasting your cyber resources in the same region. You, I mean, there is a limit to all kinds of resources. For example, when uh, people were marveling who is, who is behind what's going on before the French elections, not this one, but the previous one, after which President Macron came out and the Elysees cheers and, and attributed there and then to Russian president that you hacked our democracy during the elections. Strongest act of retaliation by a Western leader, I, I feel. I mean, we, we realized that capacity is always limited even in cybersphere because we were totally at peace at that time. So the problem is, I mean, we, we have not in international law space created a place like UN Security Council for traditional warfare where you could go and complain and hope that the international community will react to this kind of attacks. So attribution normally is not even bothered by, uh, by uh, smaller countries because, I mean, there is nowhere to go and complain. We tried, the Stone has tried to remedy this in Security Council. We've dragged the cyber incidents on the table. Georgia was attacked and while we were there, and then with the help of US and UK, we had the first ever, would you imagine, 2020, first ever Security Council debate about the cyber attack, which was well accompanying a conventional uh, situation as well. And now we've had also a formal discussion in Security Council how to go about it. But uh, I mean, we, our legal system has not kept up with the need of the cyber, uh, of, of, I mean, fighting back cyber warfare and understanding what is the rule of law and how it applies in the cyber conflicts. Very few countries, UK, Estonia, for example, have declared their intent on how they read international law and national law in cyber conflicts. So there is a relatively low level of, of, uh, of case law uh, on that as well. But uh, we, need to, we need to, even while we are concentrating on the conventional war in Ukraine, we need to keep developing international architecture of understanding and also acting, attributing where you can go and complain, what will thereafter happen. We need to do it. The other thing that has struck me about the war in Ukraine with respect to cybersecurity is that the, the biggest cyber attacks have actually come from cyber vigilantes. Unify, I mean, the hackers of the world have unified against, against Putin. And this seems great in this particular conflict, but does this pose bigger uh, concerns and challenges for the international community going forward? Absolutely, because that's a very important question. If non-governmental actors or governmental actors in cyberspace act with good intentions, which kind of rules they would have to apply? Tallinn manuals give you quite good understanding how governments could, I mean, operate in this cybersphere, but about the uh, voluntary and NGO type of uh, actors, this is not even academically very well understood. And I think we need to take notice of what is happening and imagine that this all could also be used in a, in a, for more pushing more sinister case than, uh, than trying to hurt, uh, hurt the aggressor right now uh, in Ukraine. So I, I think that this is one of the interesting tensions with respect to cybersecurity, the fact that a lot of the technological sophistication 
is held in the hands of private entities. It's not just on the hacker side, but it's also on the side of those who are providing security against cyber attacks. To what extent is government dependent on private entities for cybersecurity? Do you think it's going to be the case that governments will lag behind? This is a general, general problem or opportunity, whichever way you want to look, of the free world. Again, I mean, in, if you look back to 20th century, then from internet to nuclear arms to flying to, to the moon, this was, I mean, steered by the governments. So free, in the free world as well, the governments always knew where technology is taking our possibilities also in the war situations. Nowadays, tech development in free world happens in private sector. I mean, no public body can contribute as much resources as they can. So technology is developed in the, in the private sector. And I know that, for example, NATO is putting a lot of emphasis in, in making this cooperation, therefore, with private sector to work, that we understand what, can, what could also, I mean, be useful to defend ourselves or, I mean, to build up where we need to build up our own capabilities, considering that our adversaries still control by government what is happening in the tech world. I don't want to change it in the free world. I really appreciate for what private sector is doing. Private sector is always better in developing new technologies than public sector. But we have to recognize that we have such a problem, if you want. And we have to know how to overcome this, how to work together with the private sector. And let's use also this war situation now to I mean, make sure we understand better each other. So can you give us some insight as to what NATO is doing on this front? Uh, over the last several decades, NATO has worked really hard to integrate military forces on the conventional front. But this is a, a new and a unique challenge. Well, definitely NATO is, uh, has well described that we have an issue, and it has started also a few programs where it develops together with the private sector. But mostly, I would say, we are at an investigative phase and just realizing that this is what we have in the free world. So I would demand NATO to put more and more effort in it. And I know that uh, it's the responsibility of uh, Vice Secretary General Mirza Giano that he well, has, has good plans to make sure that we actually do take private sector on board more in the future. But already in this, this war in, uh, in Ukraine, and even previously, when we had, for example, this border conflict where migrants were used uh, to, uh, to, uh, to create disturbances in, in Poland and Lithuania, we noticed that our own nascent uh, military, uh, military industry from Estonia put forward quite a lot of smart equipment to help in that situation. And I'm sure the same is going on right now uh, in, in this big conflict. So uh, military industry uh, and 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 dual-use uh, industry realizes also their opportunities in it. And if you have an opportunity for business, they use it, as you know. So do you imagine NATO partnering with private industry going forward? I, the, one example that stands out to me in the Ukraine war is that after Russia's military knocked out Ukrainian communications, Elon Musk flipped a switch and made internet access available for all of Russians through his own satellite link. And Ukrainian soldiers, a lot of them had said that this, you know, this marked a, a, a sea change in the, in the tide of the war. Yeah, I've been thinking in more general terms about it. I mean, we used to live in the world where we pay taxes and governments decide, organize, took initiatives. And we've seen that this has changed globally. People have more free time, more resources. So as a society, as communities, as various groupings, we participate in deciding where this world is going. And it applies on all fronts. Think about Statoil, I mean, being punished by people because it decided to buy Russian oil. I mean, people said, we don't want this. I know that in our region, companies are actively seeking guarantees that the gas they would be using next winter is not from Russia. Because, I mean, there is people's power. And I believe also in the military, we need to take the same approach, that there is a power in the private sector, in third sector, which we could, I mean, use. We all work together in it, like we do in other fronts in society, which wasn't the case a couple of decades ago. So what's so special if we talk about NATO? Nothing, actually. It's the same as keeping our societies intact and together against hybrid risks, where we do rely on our people. So I have several questions here, um, some about sanctions. Uh, maybe let me ask you this question. You've mentioned the importance of sustaining sanctions even after the war. 
let's just take a couple steps back and try to understand what the purpose of the sanctioning coalition is. Is it to effectuate re regime change? Is it, is it to put pressure on Putin just to capitulate? Surely he anticipated in advance that he would, that he would experience sanctions. He was as prepared as he could be. Uh, let's face it, yeah. uh, we know that. Uh, in long term, indeed, the sanctions have to make sure that this regime has no resources to rearm its army. Today, I believe this is the most visible objective. There might be others to, I mean, help Russian people to come to the conclusion that they need regime change and so on, but these connecting chains are far, far longer. Well, there it's a really kind of a easy to see that if Russia is economically in a difficult position, army could not be rearmed. They were doing it anyway at the expense of education, healthcare, for example. If you look at the Russian public spending, it's heavily skewed towards military spending compared to, uh, to everybody else. But it's a country which economy was the size of Spain before the war, probably is now far smaller. And, and therefore, there is a real chance that uh, with, with economic sanctions in place, they simply cannot afford a war. I think this is a really good objective to have. So I, I have a question about, um, you mentioned that the sanctioning regime, you mentioned that the sanctions had they been imposed and, and had they been sustained after 2008, then we wouldn't end up where we are. It's, it's possible. It's I possible. Well, certainly say that, but I think if we had tried at least, but we didn't. So what about the counter argument? Because of course this is an argument that could be extended into the future, which is the reason why we need to maintain these sanctions going forward is because, um, is because it will hopefully avoid and prevent future conflicts. Um, what about the counter argument that says that once you have leveraged yourself, then there's really no other mechanism by which you can, you can impose punishment. Yeah, but what, I mean, yeah, it's like, let's hold some firepower in reserve. What for? What, for what situation? I mean, we already have something which many people believe is the Third World War. So I think we should indeed go full throttle in, in this area. What is that to be gained from holding back from right now? So I agree with that. I guess the question is, why would imposing sanctions on, into the future? Well, let's just go back. Why would maintaining sanctions after 2008, why would that have actually allow, um, allowed us to avoid a war? How would it have taken us down that pathway? I just said that Russia, on the expense of healthcare and education, already, well, has been uh, building up its army, and it has not worked out very well, obviously, as we see right now in Ukraine. So, I mean, even more sanctions and, and less economic development, therefore, could have actually, I mean, meant less prepared army. But frankly speaking, I also, I mean, Russian people finally as well have a say in this game. I mean, there are, I mean, elections even in Russia, there, there has been stronger and stronger push by the regime to make these elections less and less free. They are not free, they've not been free, I mean, for a long time. But I believe that Russian people themselves, I mean, Russian civil society is fantastic. Even, even in the Soviet Union, I grew up in, uh, in, uh, in occupied Estonia under the Soviet regime. People are relatively well educated also today in Russia. And I mean, they also see the advantages of living in the free world. So maybe would have been behind of us already, this kind of development. Because many think that what is going on with Russia is inevitable. I don't think, and I think this is the root cause of why Putin is so afraid of Ukraine succeeding. I mean, Russia could be a democratic, freedom-loving, peaceful rule of law nation as Ukrainians want to be. And to help them to become one Unfortunately, today means sanctions and also meant then. So let's talk a little bit about NATO membership and NATO enlargement. <clears throat> in the coming weeks, um, before the summit, the NATO summit and pending NATO summit at the end of June, um, we expect a couple of things to happen at that summit and in the lead up to that summit. One is we expect that Sweden and Finland will made a, make a bid for membership. And then the other thing is, is that we expect NATO to discuss and to potentially reveal some information about new strategic concept. Uh, Russia has already threatened Sweden and Finland. Um, Friday last week, I think that there, was, there were reports of a Russian military aircraft flying into Swedish airspace. 
Russia has threatened that if they continue down this pathway, they'll deploy nuclear weapons uh, to that particular theater. Is this something that's likely to trigger a conflict between now and the time that Finland and Sweden get NATO membership? Well, worst thing we could do is to start demonstrating that we are, uh, I mean, afraid of these threats and therefore drag our legs. And I don't think Finns and Sweden, the Swedes are going. If they have decided and made up their mind, by the way, you don't have to wait the summit. Ambassadors can gather and, and I mean, uh, decide uh, to, to accept the, 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 uh, this, their, their uh, quest to join. Of course, it all has to be ratified, which takes time, but they could already be in the summit. I mean, more behind the table than they as EOPs anyway are. So uh, it can move quite quickly. And demonstrating to, uh, to uh, Putin that we have resolve is the most important thing. I mean, he is only afraid of seeing us being strong. Any kind of weakness, any kind of which he would again say, okay, these Westerners, they don't dare, is a risk. Everything else is less of a risk. But of course, there is risk in everything. I mean, but nowadays, frankly speaking, knowing also how many troops which used to be behind our eastern, eastern borders are now removed and fighting in Ukraine, seriously, no, nothing can go wrong, I'm sure, there. So, uh, it's still to be decided by Finnish and Swedish people, but uh, I'm sure it's a safe path and a short window of opportunity where the public mind is in unity with also what is going on within NATO and they, they can join if they wish. So the NATO rules for membership, they condition getting a membership action plan, as you know, on there being an absence of conflict, um, even small regional separatist types of conflicts. What's to prevent Putin from stirring up a little bit of conflict there as he's done in Ukraine in the past. Because even this far less decisive body of European Union can throw all the rules out of the window in case of emergency. Sure, NATO can do the same. So you think that NATO might actually change its, its rules between now and, and June? Or do you think that they would just fast track this? We didn't change in European Union any rules to fight back financial crisis, but we fought the financial crisis. I'm quite sure that in multilateral bodies, rules are not created to hinder what needs to be done, but to help what needs to be done. So I'm not worried at all about, at all about any administrative procedures. Let's not think about that. Well, we have just a couple minutes left. I would like to ask you some bigger questions about the future of conflict in this world. Um, tell us, from your perspective, we have a bunch of scholars here and people that are working on questions related to conflict. What are the big issues that we need to be working on? I think our century is going to be spent in, uh, in proving to our own people that democracies can work, that we can remain free democracies, not turning into a kind of quicker moving powers who do not consult people in order to, I mean, push back than those, those who are these kind of powers. And, and this is what is the most important thing in this century. And in this, we have to rely indeed on what democracy does best. It gives voice to various groups in our society. And social media, which for a while we thought like, this is actually breaking our societies. Now in this case of Ukrainian war, we see that it also is very useful tool for the forces of, of good, making the voice of everybody heard and matter. And I believe this is what we have to rely on, the really true power of our people. Because if you look back, let's say, to 50s, uh, 60s in, in Western Europe, where people could vote, but I mean, they were mostly working in industries, doing tough, manual jobs. They didn't read that many newspapers. They didn't look at that much information. Their vote was scattered more or less equally among those parties who were there, and the small, you could call them kind of meritocracy or elite, decided where the countries are going. Social media, and generally, I mean, people having more free time and resources to think about what is going in in society, gave power to people. Initially, we were afraid, and we could see, I mean, this resulted maybe in Brexit, and so on, so on. So let's say the dark forces gathered the uh, well recognized quicker this change and these new opportunities, but the white side has now recognized the same. So, you know, people now do gather around good causes also. 
and we need to rely on that to make sure that our side really wins. There will be conflict, there will be difficulties, and what is very important, there is still the emerging world, which we tend to forget as soon as we have a problem in developed world. We mustn't forget. I see what Africa is trying to do through African Union, giving African countries the four freedoms like we have in Europe to freely trade among themselves, to freely move people where capital goes and all this. We need to support it. The European Union has recognized it. It is uh, channeling most of its help through African Union and big programs so to make sure that the continent can develop. I mean, all these things we need also to take into account. We need to really, indeed, enlarge the sphere of influence of the freedoms and the free world, but this is because people really tend to fun want them. We don't have to, I mean, force them on people globally. Let's just, I mean, use that people have this drive themselves. Well, on that very big note, um, let me just thank you on behalf of Vanderbilt University for being here with us today and sharing your expertise. We've benefited a great deal from your experience. Thank you, President.